Welcome to the December City Mayor's Question Time. Thank you for joining us here at City Hall. Let's waste no time and get stuck into our first question. Gary van der Bill, where are you, Gary? Hello there. Um, does Leicester have any plans to improve the traffic flow, uh, which is amongst the worst in the country? Sir Peter Salisbury. Well, the short answer to that is, Gary, yes, we do. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, indeed, uh, like all cities, uh, traffic problems, traffic issues. Um, you've got to remember, of course, that Leicester is uh, a city that has inherited uh, its road system from previous centuries. A lot of it, obviously, Roman medieval in the centre of the city, but a lot of it developed out in the uh, 20th century. Uh, and uh, during that time, of course, the cars came to be a much more important mode of travel than perhaps those uh, roads were really designed for. And uh, as a result of that, we've got a number of pinch points in this city that uh, really do continue to need to be addressed. Now, lots have been done over the years. We've got the central ring road being put in. Uh, we've got the outer ring. We've got the A46 Western Bypass. But there are still, uh, I believe, uh, a number of parts of the city which are far more congested than they need to be and do need some new roads. I suspect, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk more to Gary in a second, but I suspect that what prompts this question is that the traffic seems to be getting demonstrably worse the more you try to improve it. Well, I think it is certainly the case that uh, people have got more cars today than they had even 10 years ago, never mind 40 or 50 years ago. Um, and, of course, we've got to keep adapting the city to uh, accommodate those cars in so far as we can. But there is a limit to how far you can do that while you are working within, as I say, a city that has its origins in the medieval period, was built very large in the 19th, 20th century, and uh, wasn't built for that many cars. But I think you can't build urban motorways um, across uh, an historic city like Leicester and nowhere in the world, I think, have they been able to do that satisfactorily. But I think that the, the people have concerns about um, uh, carriageway narrowing, removal, uh, bus lanes going in, uh, on-street parking appearing, disappearing. You can understand why people are cheesed off. Well, I can understand why people are cheesed off because obviously, uh, like me, uh, at times they find themselves sitting in traffic jams that can be very frustrating indeed. Um, but there aren't easy answers to it. Uh, you know, we have got to keep this, uh, this historic city a civilised city. And I say, building urban motorways all the way across it, while it might actually move some of the queues, uh, isn't something that I'm going to be thanked for as mayor. I think what I do recognise, though, and to come back to the answer I was giving you initially to Gary, is that there are some parts of the city where we do actually need some new road schemes, and I'm particularly aware that that's the case when you're coming in, say, on the motorway, Narborough Road, getting across the river to the other side of the city, there are too few links. It's also the case when you look at the shopping uh, traffic that's coming into the city, particularly into the High Cross, that uh, the pressure point in Vaughan Way is one that does need some fairly radical attention. The concern is, though, that your interventions have actually caused more problems than they've solved. Well, I think, actually, uh, the evidence doesn't show that, then. I mean, I know people, you know, say, well, if you take a lane out of a road, uh, you Yeah, but must... the trouble is that people don't believe that, know, because they're sitting that. in those traffic jams every morning. Ben, I know that very well, and I know that people believe that if you take a lane out of any road, you must somehow be making the traffic worse. It doesn't work quite like that. So long as you keep the capacity of those junctions flowing well, which we have done, you can actually improve the journey times through those roads, and we have done that. Now, as I say, people find that hard to, hard to accept, but it is indeed the case. We've measured it. But there are some real issues, and I've identified two of the main ones, the river crossing and Bourne Way, some real issues in some parts of the city where we do actually need to look, I think, radically at some new road solutions. Gary, you asked the question, is that because you're a motorist, are you frustrated? I am frustrated. I am a motorist. I live in Oby. I work at uh, Enderby. It takes me 50 minutes to do seven miles. If I lived upon uh, Asquith Way, I'd be mortified because the amount of diesel fumes which are spewing out every morning cannot be good for health. It's just a shocker. The pork pie roundabout isn't working. And as Foss Park uh, at, the, at Grove, uh, Grove, Grove Park is a nightmare. But do you, do you accept the, the city mayor's point, though, that, that you know, when our city fathers 2,000 years ago decided that here was just about the perfect place to live, they hadn't factored in motor cars, you well, know, 20 centuries hence? The 1950s inner ring road was a dual carriageway, and it's never been put into a dual carriageway. It's single lane all the way through, but I've seen the original plans. Yes, uh, that's very true. And what they sought to do at that time was to build a network of dual carriages across the city, and it didn't matter that there were houses in the way, 
and it didn't matter that there were communities in the way. And they did, at that time, I think many of them think that you could actually build, perhaps not urban motorways, but certainly dual carriageways through historic parts of the city and it didn't matter. And that's how we got the underpass in, in the city, carved through the, um, the Roman Forum, it was. Now, nobody will thank me for doing that today. And I think it is also the case that were I to do some of those sorts of schemes today, frankly, it would make very little difference because road traffic is growing so fast. But, and I come back to the big but, I've said it a couple of times already, there are some particular pinch points that require some radical thinking and some new roads. Well, let's talk about that radical thinking in a second. Stephen Carty, uh, are you here as well this evening? Stephen's right at the back, if we can just get a microphone to him. Because, Stephen, you, you ask a similar question to Gary, but you also go further to ask if there are kind of green initiatives to reduce congestion. Yeah, um, I asked, uh, currently around Welford Road, and all the roads connecting to it are insanely uh, chaotic. Are there plans on green initiatives such as carpooling to help relieve congestion and reduce Leicester's carbon footprint? Rory Palmer, I think this, this has got your name on it, hasn't it? Well, I, I worry about the health impacts of some of what we see on our road network. I think we all do, and I think it's only in the last couple of years that the air quality debate has really started to take off here in Leicester, but actually uh, in cities across the country, not least in our capital city, where we're talking more about air quality and its relationship with transport more than ever. And I think we need to somehow reset the debate about transport because we have a very one-dimensional debate, and it all anchors around car travel. Now, I'm a motorist, uh, I drive into the city and out of the city several times a week, but let me be honest, I would much rather be hopping on a bus and be able to spend 10, 15 minutes doing my emails or tweeting or something like that. I don't want to sit in in the traffic, but of course, you know, we, we have challenges in how we improve the public transport network. I was in London earlier this week. I hopped on a bus for a quick five minute journey with an Oyster card. It was a modern bus. Uh, it got me to where I wanted to be on time. It was convenient. It was modern. The challenge for us is to work within the powers that we have to continue to modernise public transport. Uh, we are, you know, vastly constrained as compared to London in terms of the powers we have to do that. It's been a great frustration for us over five years now. We've been arguing with government to enhance the powers uh, that we have to, to strengthen and improve public transport. More broadly, uh, I think we've got a really strong story to tell on the work we've been doing to improve cycling in the city. Cycling rates are going up year on year on year uh, dramatically. That's because the infrastructure investment that we've made. It's because we have more 20 mile an hour zones now in the city so people, more co people feel more confident cycling and indeed walking in their, uh, their local communities as well. We do have carpool and car share schemes. Actually, if you look on our website and on the county council's website, there are car share schemes. They're just not taking off here. Uh, they're not really taking off in, in other towns and cities. And actually, this debate, this whole sort of question, requires us as policymakers to do our bit, but it actually requires us as individuals, as citizens, to take our share of responsibility and prepare to change our behaviour as well. Stephen, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up with you in a second. Rory, I mean, it's an interesting point. There's, a, there's, there's the, the, the park and ride. I drive past it every day on my way into town mm. uh, in Burstall at the top end. It's just one of them. And um, I know that I, I, you will no doubt tell me that from a percentage perspective, it sees rises year on year. And yet, when I drive past it, two-thirds, often more than that, mm. is, is empty, even at peak times like Christmas. What do you have to do to encourage people to use it? It's a good question, Ben, and if there was an easy answer, I would have done it by now. And I get frustrated, I know Peter gets frustrated okay. when we look at the, uh, some of the usage figures for park and ride and we see those great big car parks sitting empty. I uh, honestly don't know why. Does it, I mean, does uh, it have a future? Well, I think, I think ultimately it will need to have a future of, of some description if we want to sort of stay true to uh, a vision of having a transport system in the city that is sustainable environmentally, is addressing some of those concerns around air quality, but is crucially effective in getting people from A to B efficiently, uh, affordably and conveniently. So picking up on what, on what Stephen said, is there an argument that says, OK, we tried park and ride, it, it kind of worked a bit, it cost us quite a lot of money to keep doing it, pull the funding in that, sell it for housing or whatever it is, and um, spend the money on something else that might work better. 
I don't think we want to necessarily abandon park and ride in, in, in its entirety at this stage. I think we need to have a, a conversation with people, find out what, what people out there think about park and ride. Why are people who drive into the city every day not using it? Does it not go to the right places at the right time? We've amended the route several times. Uh, I got the LRI onto the route a couple of, couple of years ago, uh, which I know has been of great benefit to, to NHS staff working on the, the LRI. Uh, site and hopefully a, a benefit for patients and visitors uh, as well. I think there are no straightforward answers to, to these questions around transport, but I think we're doing the right things in terms of the investment to improve the road network, improve cycling infrastructure, uh, but there are some real frustrations there for us to address, which we're committed to. Park and ride is one, uh, and public transport is another, where we, where we need a completely different settlement uh, in cities like Leicester in terms of the powers that we have uh, to, to improve public transport. So Peter Salisbury, I know that one of the things that, that you've often said about being a city mayor, and this is replicated in, in areas up and down the country, so you can make a decision, and by and large, it, it pretty much happens. And I understand that there are not the powers there in certain areas of transport, but is there not an initiative that you could say, look, we're going to do this, we're going to try this, and we're going to start, you know, in a week's time? I think uh, one of the greatest frustrations I've had in uh, my job as city mayor now, five years, uh, is the inability to have the powers to commission bus services in the same way that the Mayor of London has got. You know, the fact is, I mean, Rory's given the example, you know, from, from his journey down there uh, uh, earlier in the week, and, you know, I've experienced it myself. The fact is that they have vastly increased the usage of London buses because the Mayor of London has been able to say where they run, when they run, the price at which they run, and the quality of the service that is provided. And although the government is promising something similar, and has kept promising it without the last five years when I've ever asked them for it, we have not yet got it. And it is an intense frustration. And every single, meet the mayor of Enterton out in the street, mayoral question times like this, the issue of the bus service in Leicester has come up. And every single time I've expressed my frustration, and I've expressed it very loudly to government as well. Now, they've got a bus bill at the moment it might give us the powers. But they're putting all sorts of conditions around it. Uh, many MPs, many Lords are actually pressing them to give us the powers. Uh, I'll be continuing to add my voice to that. But that's what we need. Stephen, your thoughts on that? If, if you were sitting uh, in Sir Peter's chair, what would you do? Um, well, I just know like from experience with a few of my friends and that lot, I've got some that work down in London, and they also, like through their business, have uh, carpooling schemes where yeah. if they pick people up on the way and everything they get reimbursed for their petrol and other things and that lot as well they get cheaper parking in public uh, car parks and such and that in itself as well as uh, help minimize a lot of the traffic going into canary wharf well down towards canary wharf sort of way so i was just thinking maybe there's things like that through the car parks and that lot within the city centre for people like that and getting in contact with other big businesses within the city centre and putting pressure on them to try and sort of also take up the slack a little as well. So Peter Salisbury, just, uh, Stephen, thank you. Just before we finish on it, I've got to ask you this, because somewhere in a drawer in your office, or might be in your in-tray, there will be a thing marked trams. Because it's one of those things, you know, Nottingham have tried it, I think it cost them a fortune. Edinburgh had just about bankrupted the city, but they would say that it's working quite now, quite well. There are cities across Europe that say it's a fabulous thing. It's, it seems an increasing shame that we got rid of ours. Is there any move on that, or is that an absolute no-no? Over the years, uh, this city has done quite a number of studies as to whether it was worthwhile to try to reintroduce trams. But as you've hinted in your question there, uh, others have had very disappointing experiences of them. They're put forward as the, uh, you know, the answer to all of the problems, transportation problems of a city. In fact, they end up costing an awful lot of money and carrying a comparatively small proportion of passengers. Um, now, that isn't to say that at some time in the future it might not make sense to Leicester, but it doesn't add up at the moment. Actually, what would add up for Leicester is a proper bus service that provides and is founded on the premise of producing a public service. Not just one that is essentially runs down the, the main roads at the peak hours uh, and is motivated not so much by public service, but inevitably, in the, for these companies, by the bottom line. 
Let's move on from transport. If, uh, if anybody has a further question on transport later on, it's one of those things that really exercises people, then, then do stick your hand up. But let's move on to the next question. Naomi Diamond, where are you, Naomi? Thank you. Um, what is the plan for supporting and directing more resources out to the more deprived neighbourhoods of the city, particularly to mitigate the effects of service cuts and uh, the city centre bias in development and regeneration? Kirk Master, I think that's, uh, that's on your job description, isn't it? Yeah, uh, important question. I think we're obviously a local authority that's got cuts that have been enforced on us by central government and looking after our communities, our deprived communities and all our communities, quite frankly, is a key challenge for us going forward. We've got a number of buildings that we've inherited over years from a county authority moving into a city um, authority that are located just because they were there. They don't actually fit with community dynamics. They don't actually fit with the geography of the, the communities themselves. So we're, we're looking at different things in terms of what is the need going forward. From my particular portfolio, we're running a transforming neighborhood service um, scheme, which is looking at the number of buildings that we have across the city and a number of wards and how we can reduce that number of buildings that, that we own um, and, and run, particularly because of budget cuts. But the, the important fact behind that is to maintain the services. So we're not looking to reduce any services that we're currently operating at in the communities right now. And in fact, through the process, we've carved the city up into six different areas and we've consulted with, you know, uh, you, you can check back on the website, hundreds of groups and hundreds and hundreds of individuals through the consultation process to find out exactly what is important for communities from a service perspective. And in the majority of cases, they've said it's not the physical building, it's the services that are being provided there. And not by us as a local authority, some obviously are, but in the main, it's community groups that are providing these services. And that's what's important to them. So we are looking at, at, at different things and we work with partners around this as well because we can't provide services we can't provide buildings and facilities for everybody and every group. So it's important we do this as part of a, a partnership collective going forward. So we are looking at different aspects of things. In terms of the investment coming into the city and not out into the county, uh, into the communities uh, and the, the surrounding wards, I don't necessarily agree with that. We do invest through our highways infrastructure, through our cleansing programs, through our regulatory services programs, through our city wardens, through our community ward budgets, through our neighborhood services, through our libraries, library services. So the, there is a huge amount of investment that goes back out into the wards. It's just, it, it's not seen as literal as a, as a, a scheme at any one time. Kirk, let me just interrupt there for a minute. Um, you know, that, that whole list of all your investments, and yet people still feel hacked off that they see a reduction of the services that they feel that they require and pay for. Now, there may well be an argument for it, and you may well come back and say, well, actually, there is no reduction, but the point is that people feel that, so the outreach work somewhere is failing. And the, there's, there's no hidden secret that the, the pound that we have to spend out there is shrinking. You know, there is no hidden secret to that. And I think that, that what we need to do as an authority uh, and, and as an executive is try and ensure that we can spend that pound in the, in the best possible way. Sorry, Sir Peter's got well, his hand up there. I just wonder if I could put some figures behind that, because, um, you know, I don't think uh, perhaps uh, as, as loud in shouting about this as, as perhaps we need to be. But the fact is, if you take the figure from 2010 to till 2020, right, so we're in the middle of that period, I'll just be on the middle of that period now, the City Council will have, at the end of that period, a hundred and fifty five million pounds less to spend every year than it had at the beginning of that period. Now, you've heard me say this one before, but you don't save 155 million pounds by buying fewer paper clips. You know, it, it you know, really does impact on services. And we're having that much less to spend at a time when the cost of adult social care is growing, the cost of children's social care is growing. And it means that everything else, because you know we're an aging population and we've got to keep looking after the children, we want to keep protecting them. So the cost of everything else is getting squeezed. Less to spend overall and more needed for those services. And, as a, and, and what it means is that when you take out those two important things, at the end of the decade, we'll be spending only about a third of the money on running costs 
as we were at the beginning of the decade. And of course, that's giving us some appallingly difficult decisions to make. But of course, and I think lots of people would understand that, which makes it more critical that this feeling of fairness comes into it, doesn't yeah. it? And outlying neighbourhoods would say, well, you know, it's all well and good, and, and we'll, we'll, you know, take on our bit of, of the reduction in funding that you've got. And yet, there is this feeling, as Naomi sort of alluded to, of the city centre bias. The city centre seems to be having a lot of redevelopment and so on. And you can understand where, if you're in a neighbourhood where the built environment's a bit crummy, you think, well, why does the city centre get all the money? But the fact is, Ben, that even though we are having dramatic cuts in our services, the overwhelming majority of our spend on running costs is actually out and about providing services in the neighbourhoods across the city. And when it comes to the capital investment, you know, expend, spending in buildings and land and so on, of course the thing people see are the things in the city centre. But just just week before last, we announced our programme of um, new school classrooms, new, new schools. £45 million pounds worth of investment on new schools, because we've got to keep providing decent proper places for our young people to be, to, to be taught and the right environment for that to happen. £45 million. Pounds. Now, compared with that one alone, the spending and investment in the city centre is dwarfed. And I could talk about a number of other services as well and give other examples as well. So actually, the fact is, when it's running costs and capital investment, most of it's happening out there where it really matters to people in the place where they live. Naomi, your thoughts? Well, I'm quite aware of the TNS process, and I think some of it's um, a good process, um, and it makes sense to rationalise buildings and co-locate services. Um, and obviously, I'm also aware of the massive budget cuts that, that Leicester is facing, along with councils all, all around the country. Um, what I don't really see is a kind of joined-up process You've got the TNS process happening, you've got consultation around children's centres and adventure playgrounds, but that's happening totally separately to the TNS process. You've got uh, work going on around looking at social care and, and changes in social care provision. But I don't see it joined up on a neighbourhood basis, and I don't see a strategy which is about working to support communities in those neighbourhoods to be part of the answer to, to support those communities to plug some of the gaps. Um, I just don't see that happening. Rory, do you, do you accept that as a criticism? Well, let's look at it a slightly different way. If we were sort of incorporating the big consultation on children's services and adventure playgrounds in the TNS exercise, I think we'd be accused of trying to hide things and trying to make things so complicated that people couldn't see the wood for the trees. Almost. Actually, I think it's right that these exercises are distinct because I think they can lead to a, a better public conversation about some very, very challenging decisions and a very challenging financial situation. I think our strategy is actually really, really clear because when I talk to the you know, people I represent in Ayers Monsal about the sort of city they want to live in, they want a city where the economy is growing, where there is investment being attracted and where there's good jobs in the future for their kids. And that's what we're trying to create. IBM, Hastings, those jobs have not arrived in this city by accident. Local people are not benefiting from those jobs and that investment by accident. That's happened because you know, we put a lot of work, a lot of effort in to make that happen. Now, clearly, there are some still some long-term structural challenges we face around living standards and poverty in parts of the city. Uh, that poverty passes from one generation to the next, like many other cities up and down the country. It's extremely difficult to address. But what I would say, you know, we are doing some really important work on that front. We've introduced a living wage here at the council. We're encouraging other employers to do it. We're involved in lots of work that deal with the, you know, the acute immediate and immediate impacts of poverty. Uh, things that we don't necessarily talk very loudly about because they're not really things we want to talk loudly about. So the money that we put into holiday hunger programmes, for example, so kids who are on free school meals can still get a meal during the school holidays. That's not something we've gone out there and press released and told the world about because, you know, as doing it is the sort of thing we would want to. It's, you know, it's an issue of dignity for those kids and young people. 
working with food banks and other organisations addressing the immediate impact of poverty. But look, let's be clear. Why do people feel their living standards in Leicester are being squeezed? It's not because we're attracting investment and improving the city centre. It's because they've seen their benefits cut by this government. It's because we've had too many years of economic stagnation and uh, you know, a jobs market that's failing too many people. They are things that clearly we, you know, we are involved in addressing. But look, you know, some much, much bigger forces at play beyond our control as well, you know, the, you know, when I talk to people, you know, they are, you know, they, they sometimes vent a little bit about city centre investment, but look, quite honestly, you know, they don't resent that investment. They see why it's important for the growth and the future of the city. It's quite often a proxy for the fact that they're, you know, on the sharp end of benefit cuts and, the, you know, the harshest consequences of five, five or six years of austerity and economic failure now. And uh, just for our audience and uh, listeners at home uh, who haven't read their City Council minutes today, uh, there'll be one or two, um, TNS stands for? Transforming Neighbourhood Services. And it uh, has been a major focus and uh, hence, of course, like uh, often happens in big bureaucracies, it becomes just its initials. But uh, it has been it's something... working in the BBC. Yeah, I know, the BBC. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. But, but it has been something that's delivered some real dramatic change. I'll give you the example of the Port Pie Library. Now, there were a number of neighbourhood facilities around in that part of the city, and, uh, of course, you know, actually closing some of them was painful. But what we've managed to get there is the investment in a stunning building and a major facility for the local, local people. It actually has saved some money as well, but it's actually been an investment out in the neighbourhoods that has transformed the neighbourhood services, and that's what TNS is about. Let's move on. Rachel Wall, where are you? Rachel, what's your question? Um, I think we've alluded to some of the possible answers to this question throughout the evening and the topics we've already discussed, but my question is, how do you feel the City of Leicester can benefit from the current government's devolution policy, and how, if so, would you like to see this policy changed? So Peter Salisbury, I'm going to have to put that one at, at, at your feet, really, uh, because, because, in a sense, you're a bit of a trailblazer of devolution, aren't you? Uh, well, I like to think I'm a bit of a trailblazer in one a number of, <laughs> a number of ways, but, but I mean the fact is that um, the government uh, has uh, said that it favours devolution, and they have got a model of devolution that undoubtedly for some parts of the country makes a lot of sense. The Greater Manchester area, getting it better stitched up with a, you know, a metro mayor across that, that makes very good sense. What they don't seem to have got their heads around is that not all of the country uh, has got either the physical or the political geography of Greater Manchester. Uh, and that it isn't a question of one size fits all when it comes to devolution. And that actually we in Leicester, Leicestershire, uh, need a form of devolution that makes sense for, for us. Here we are, a big city, not a mega city, but a big city in the middle of a predominantly rural county with lots of county towns around it. That's very different from Manchester. And what we haven't got from the government is an understanding of that difference and a model of real devolution to our area that is equivalent to the appropriate model for the Manchester area. So it's a bit frustrating at the minute. Uh, and we, together with our county colleagues, are trying to get that message through to government that we need something that fits us, that makes sense for us and for the people that we represent, not something that's uh, exported from Manchester and uh, imposed on Leicestershire. Of course, that's always one of the difficulties um, when it comes to central government, isn't it? There is always the tendency towards uh, simplification, uh, you know, so that you have the same, I mean, on a basic level, the same forms up and down the country. The last thing they're going to do is allow these, the idea of, a, of um, bespoke devolution, are they? Well, we're not the only part of the country that doesn't look like Manchester. Uh, there's quite a lot of other bits that uh, I think would uh, benefit from a similar model to the sort of model that would be appropriate for us. Uh, but as I say, they've got this one-size-fits-all, uh, this metro mayor. As I say, that's perhaps, and I think probably is, very appropriate for the large metropolitan areas. It does make sense for us. And uh, you know, I don't think that uh, it makes sense across any of the rest of Leicester either because it's very clear that none of the other district councils or the people they represent 
want to sign up to that sort of model? There are, I mean, I, I'm, you're obviously here as, as the city mayor, but I know there's lots of discussions between you and the, and the boroughs and the, and the county and so on. And th there has been moves to, to create these kind of blocks, these blocks yeah. of devolution. Is there anything we, going on with that? Or is we that are sort of well finished? advanced in creating a combined authority. Uh, that isn't something that takes away the independence of each individual council. It's actually about doing things that we are not able to do at the moment but doing them together on a, on a wider area. So each council will continue to do its own planning to provide its own bin collection or whatever else it might be. Um, but what we're looking to do is to ask the government to hand down to us some of the powers that they exercise across this area, rather than to take away from any of those district councils or from the city council, uh, some of the things that we do on behalf of the people who, uh, who elected us. And that's well advanced. We've got very good relations the, between the city and the county there are and the There are some concerns about the fact that it's not advanced enough and that you're gonna miss deadlines. Well, no, I, I mean, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna hit the deadlines. Uh, it's the government that, uh, you know, I say, hasn't yet got the message that yes, it's all very well to say you favour devolution, but you've got to look at the political and the regional and the human geography of the places to which you're devolving or proposing devolution and uh, pass the powers down in a way that's appropriate to that area. Rachel, what, what do you make of that? Um, I agree generally. I mean, I'm a proud localist and I think that any devolution arrangement should be developed from the bottom up. Um, and unfortunately, I think at the moment, if you don't live in Manchester or London, uh, the current policy won't deliver that, which I think is a great shame considering that tonight we've already identified two key areas where the, the city would benefit from greater powers, skills and transport. You know, so that I, 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 I agree. Which yeah. Excellent agreement. That's very, That's very good. <laughs> in City Hall, a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, does anybody in the audience, other than Rachel, of course, actually care about devolution? Hand, hands up, give me a hand up. If you wake up in the middle of the night and the first thing is, you know what I've got to attend to today is a bit of devolution. One, two, three, yeah, four, five. Yeah, it's, the, but, the trouble, but, I mean, not but, to put too fine a point on it, it's not very sexy, is it? But, yeah, but if you, if you put the question devolution to people, uh, of course you'll get sort of people glaze over. But if you say, do you want local people to get the sort of transport, the sort of bus transport that suits them? I mean, how, how many of you want local people to have control over local transport? Yeah, and, and you get Most a different answer. And, and that's what devolution's about. You know, it's not a word that stands by itself. It's about real services tailored for local people. And I could ask the same question about skills, and I bet I'd get the same sort of response, where you get the overwhelming majority of people saying, yeah, we want to do, decide that at a local level. Chris Doyle. Chris, uh, oh, Chris isn't actually here this so I'm going to ask the question for him. Um, has any efforts been made to tackle homelessness in the city? And if so, how will these be carried on? Rory? Uh, yes, uh, we are I mean, carrying out some extensive work over the past few years looking at how we address homelessness. Because what we're finding is that what, again, not dissimilar to many other places, we had what we came to sort of recognise and call a revolving door situation. So people find themselves in situations of homelessness would spend some time in a hostel, would leave that hostel, would very quickly uh, return to sort of Un unstable, unsustainable accommodation, probably back in a hostile environment. That's not good for those individuals in terms of trying to get people resettled and living with support independently, getting, uh, helping them to get their lives uh, back on track. And also, it's not very good from a financial point of view either, a very expensive way of providing services. So we're now much more focused on prevention and working to, to help people sustain living uh, in supported environments, putting a much, more, a much more sort of rigorous approach around when people present as potentially becoming homeless, uh, working with them very quickly to try to prevent those problems, whether it's issues of debt, uh, whether it's family breakdown, and putting our resource at, at that point in the, the cycle, if you like, as opposed to perhaps waiting until the situation is, is much more developed and, and people are either sofa surfing or, or worse. I think it's really important when we have this debate, uh, though, and we talk about this issue, that we, we distinguish very clearly between homelessness and rough sleeping. You know, they're two very different things, clearly connected, but there is this perception that, that rough sleeping rates are, are growing massively in the city. Our data would not suggest that. 
but clearly homelessness is a big challenge in, in the city as it is in most other places. But I think by, by changing the, the focus and the emphasis of our work onto prevention and early intervention, uh, we, we are starting to see some, some improvement. Well, I was going to say, because th there is a perception, isn't there, that, 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 that homelessness as, a, as an umbrella term is increasing, it is becoming easier to lose your home, and that the number of rough sleepers is increasing in the city. Now, I know at one point, and this is a long time ago, maybe 10 years or so ago, the City Council proudly said there are no homeless people in Leicester. We've got it sorted, no. we've got it, we've got it um, nailed. That clearly wasn't the case. Sir Peter Salisbury? Ben, I don't think we ever said there are no homeless people in Leicester, but I want to distinguish, as Rory did, between uh, homelessness, which is quite a significant problem in the city, and nobody's, at, you know, we haven't made that go away, and rough sleeping. Uh, and rough sleeping are, are sort of the, the sharp point of the pyramid, really. You know, there's a lot more down there uh, who are, in one way or another, homeless. They don't have a settled home, the sofa surfing or whatever it might be. But the numbers who are rough sleeping are actually quite small in numbers. And I do, you know, because of my own concern about this, get um, a regular uh, weekly update on what the situation is with rough sleepers. Um, and I, it, it, it just happens. I, I, I got it this morning, and I've got it here with me. And this is the, uh, the snapshot from Friday the 2nd of December, right? Uh, and they found 16 individuals who were found rough sleeping. Now, the fact is, the, these are all people whose names we know, most of whom, whose backstory we know as well. So 16 people uh, rough, uh, rough sleeping. Nine of them are people who have refused all help, including temporary accommodation. Four of them were people from abroad, and they happen to be people from abroad who have refused help and assistance in being repatriated. And three of them, three out of the 16, uh, were people who were prepared to accept assistance and have got, since that snapshot was taken, temporary accommodation. Now, okay, it, it does mean that there are some people out there on the streets, but I think we do need to recognise that the council does understand the situation, has got a measure of the situation, and is doing what it reasonably can to help. When we get into figures, it always starts to, to worry me, because I know that one um, uh, rough sleeping charity uh, just recently has said um, 22 last year, 36 this year, uh, the, the, we could bandy the figures backwards and forwards. Ben, ben, the I'm fact not bandying is figures. No, no, no. I tell no, no, you, I, these I, people who count this work with those charities and are able to put their professional reputations on the line to back these figures. And they I are accurate. I understand that, but I also understand that, that, that we're talking about people, some of whom don't want, don't want help for all kinds of reasons. But is there anything that the City Council can do, even under those circumstances, to make what is an extremely tough life choice a little less awful. Yeah, and, and there are lots of things we do to try and work with these people to try to find, uh, not just for those who are in and out in hostels, but for, particularly for those who are at the very sharp end of this, who are rough sleeping, to find ways of helping them into a more settled lifestyle. Uh, you know, we're not insensitive to it. We're not dismissing of them. But the fact is, they tend to be people who have a multitude of difficult problems difficult issues to deal with uh, and frankly uh, it's not easy always to help them help themselves thank you very much indeed lucy peel lucy where are i'll pretend to be lucy um <laughs> what plans do you have to support the creation and growth of small businesses within the city. Rory Palmer. I think a big part of our focus has to be creating the right physical environment. So all that city centre investment, but investment in neighbourhoods as well, because it's not just the city centre economy that's important for small businesses. It's, uh, it's places like Queen's Road, Narborough Road, Evington Road, uh, Knight and Shops, Aberdale Road, all those sort of local shopping areas as well. We talked about traffic earlier. That's something that comes up a lot when I talk with, with small businesses. Car parking. We increased very quickly, within a matter of weeks of Peter becoming mayor, uh, we increased the number of free on-street parking bays in the evening to support the evening economy, to support bars, restaurants and shops. So big focus on creating the right physical environment, but also I think you know, one of our key roles is attracting and leveraging in external funding, whether that's European funding, whether that's government funding, so we can uh, support businesses with, uh, with grants to help them grow. And expand. I remember visiting a catering firm a couple of years ago would help them buy a new industrial fridge with a grant that helped them grow, help them develop. They tried to lock me in the fridge, which uh, <laughs> some more interesting visits I've done. But 
And that's a good example. And I guess one of the things that I worry about, we haven't touched on it in the debate, and, and dare I mention it or not, but a lot of that funding is European funding. And post-Brexit, you know, we have to worry and be concerned about what that will mean for our ability to continue to, to attract that funding, to grow, to support small businesses. I'd just be interested to know, post the vote uh, for Brexit, Obviously, we're still members of the European Union. Is that funding still forthcoming yeah. and those funding streams still active? Yeah, I mean, there was clearly some uncertainty uh, in the immediate aftermath of the, the referendum, and, and those were questions that we, or many other councils, were asking very quickly to see, seek clarity. So, so current schemes that people are signed up to and, and have, have, were given the green light pre-referendum will continue to be funded. But clearly, we have to now wait and see what sort of arrangement the, the government will negotiate with the European Union. But whatever sort of Brexit is, hard or soft, I'm pretty sure the European Union will not be uh, generously funding economic growth, skills development or, or anything else in the United Kingdom. I think it's a, it's a great shame that funding has been very, very important to us here in Leicester. And so, Peter, with, with Brexit looming at some point over the horizon, does it matter to you what kind of Brexit, of all the, the myriads that we seem to be being put forward at the moment? Uh, yes, it does. I, I'm particularly concerned if uh, we find ourselves uh, opting out in such a way that the free movement of people is, uh, is affected. Uh, we're a city that is uh, open to people from across the world to come and make their home here. We've been benefited enormously from those who've made their home here. And of course, uh, if suddenly the doors were closed to those who have come to work here from Europe, from other parts of Europe, uh, I think we'd be very much the losers. Uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, benefited uh, and got enormous uh, advantage from the skills that people have brought, but particularly the some, entrepreneurial some, skills. So some people that voted to leave, that was precisely why they voted to leave. I know. And uh, I think that's uh, very sad. And uh, I think that we as a city, uh, we voted not by a big margin, but we did vote to remain in the European Union. And I think that's a reflection of the fact that, at least for the majority of people, they want uh, our country to be a part of Europe and a part of the world, not uh, a little island and to pull up the drawbridge. Let's go to our next question. Pardeep Gill, what's your question for the Mayor? Thank you. Is he, uh, the mayor aware that uh, a large number of blind and visually impaired people are literally unable to use the new Haymarket bus station due to, for example, problem, problems finding the glass entrance door without help and not being able to clearly see the uh, destination panels on the buses as they draw into the station due to the structural design of the building? To what extent, if any, have the needs of disabled people been looked at during the planning phase, and now that the station is fully operational, would the mayor consider a consultation as to the usability? Sir Peter. Uh, very short answer. I was not aware of that particular problem with it. Inevitably, with the new public building, there are issues that uh, emerge, uh, and we have had uh, a couple of sessions uh, when we've reviewed the way in which it's operating and made a number of uh, apparently small modifications, but some modifications that you know, account for the fact that uh, you, know, you uh, inevitably have to, have to um, you know, look at what's happening in practice. It, uh, now, I haven't been made aware of that particular issue. I have now. Uh, and the short answer is yes, I would be delighted to meet with you and others uh, to take account of any issues that you've got. I'm sure there will be ways in that very fine building of making sure that it is uh, usable and accessible to all, uh, and in this case, uh, those who have uh, visual impairment. There's a gentleman just, just next to Pardee. Yes, what's, what's your name, I'm, first of all? Uh, Roy Birch. I'm Pardee's companion. We compiled that question uh, between us. And thank you very much indeed for your response, Sir Peter. We're very pleased to hear that, that we, little group of four here, are all visually impaired to one degree or another. And in fact, as my colleague has already said, we are particularly disappointed, to put it mildly, that that bus station for myself and a great many other visually impaired people is literally unusable. We are particularly disappointed that uh, blind and disabled and visually impaired people seem not to have been consulted before the bus station was um, completed and so on, but we very much welcome and appreciate your offer of perhaps establishing a little consultation group where we can feed back to you in due course. Well, as I say, I'd be very, very happy to hear of the issues that you've got with the bus station, although I think it was the case that there was a degree of consultation. It may not have been with you particularly, but uh, I know that disability issues were uh, incorporated into its design. 
perhaps not adequately, but it wasn't done without uh, at least some uh, recognition that there needed to be. I'll just add to that, if I may. As I say, we, are all, we all sit on um, one or two formal and informal uh, groups of consultation for visually impaired people. This is our particular speciality right. because we are all visually impaired and we're certainly not aware of any consultations with visually impaired people. But we, you know, we're very pleased to well, hear that. I will, uh, set, about, I will set about seeking to remedy that Lovely. both with Thank this particular one, Lovely. but if there are lessons to be learned uh, about the way in which when doing these sorts of schemes, we uh, actually make sure we do take account of your views and those with other uh, for forms of disability in advance. I will certainly make sure that we learn the lessons. There is another, there is another, there's another question on this topic, actually. Uh, front row, what's your name, madam, first of all? Sujata Barrot from the Belgrave Community Neighbourhood Watch Group. Um, just to add to that other question about the new bus station. I am also a member of the Leicester Disabled Peoples Group. We were consulted. We did put that exact representation in that process, which was quite a lengthy one. We actually physically went to visit the station. But by that time, once we'd seen it, it was too late. We were told to change things. We said, look, other cities nearby also have audio and visual representation. So if I'm sitting there and I cannot see the notice board of what times the buses are coming and if there's a bus that's been delayed or, God forbid, a bus has been cancelled. If I have a sight issue, I will not be able to see that. So we want audio as well as sight. And that representation was made through. So I welcome what Sir Peter is saying, that he will look into that now and do something about it if he can. Can we reasonably suggest that that will be the top of your to-do list tomorrow, Sir Peter? I know it, you have a very busy will. list, and, but... And, and, and it happens that <coughs> at the back of this room there are a couple of members of my staff who I see are uh, very assiduously noting down this point, and it will be top of the agenda tomorrow. And perhaps something we can do on, on BBC Radio Leicester and see if there can be changes made and so Absolutely. on and so forth, but thank you for those questions. And, and actually, one of the things to do, actually, Ben, is to take a walk down there with, uh, you know, with those who made the representations yeah. so they actually show us on the ground what the well, We will definitely are. follow up. And I'll be very happy to go down with them, and if you want to come along with a microphone, yeah. you'd be very welcome. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Sounds like there may be uh, some further consultation on that. Pritesh Patel, where are you? Where are you? What's your question? Uh, currently, what is being done to increase tourism into the city, and is there a plan in place going forward? Sir Peter Salisbury. Um, well, we've had a few things happen in this city <laughs> that have um, caused people to notice us. Of course, we... Uh, found uh, some bones in the car park, uh, and that helped. And of course, the eyes of the world were on us when we did that. And then, of course, uh, a certain football team of ours did rather well last season, uh, and that uh, gave us a lot of attention as well. But even before that, we know we've got 2,000 years of history. We've got a very attractive city, uh, one that actually sometimes we haven't really fully appreciated, and uh, I think, you know, are, are beginning to, to appreciate now. And increasingly, both because of the profile we've had and because of you know, frankly, some of the things we've done in the city centre to make it a very attractive place. We're getting people coming here as tourists. And you see them you know, around the city. You, you, you see them with maps. Now, a lot of things are being done to bring them here in the first place. A lot of things are being done to make sure that when they get here, they've got good things to do. The Richard III Visitor Centre is the latest one. Uh, and, of course, uh, we've got a number of other projects in mind uh, to make sure that when they get here, they've got things to visit and things to do. I'm very keen on interpreting Roman Leicester as using the jury wall. So there's lots of things to do. But entirely by coincidence, I promise you, just today, uh, and sitting on my table upstairs, are the new um, signs that we're putting up with maps so that you don't get tourists walking around the town looking lost. I mean, so, uh, sorry to interrupt when you're in mid-flow, but that's an interest. We've talked about this at these events yeah, before, yeah. This, the sort of interpretation and signposting in the city as being wanting. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the uh, foundations for all of these, I, th I think it's 80 in total. I, don't, I, 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 may, I, I may be misremembering the number. But uh, they're going up, uh, the foundations are going in place uh, this side of Christmas, and the actual boards are going up uh, just after Christmas, I think over a six-week period uh, in, in, into the new year. You begin to see them out there. And of course, they're for tourists and, visit, uh, uh, tourists and visitors, but they're also for Leicester people. Because I don't think we should assume that all Leicester people know all of their city centre. Uh, and of course, on the back of that, a lot of the stuff that uh, visit, the Visit Leicester uh, shop is doing and the service that they're providing, both physically there and online, uh, is constantly being improved. 
So yes, I think uh, we need to recognise that uh, people are wanting to come here, more will want to come here in future, and that we need to make them welcome. Because there is the, there is the worry, isn't there, that, uh, that we all sit back and sort of go, well, Rich the Third and, and yeah. uh, Leicester City, we've done fantastically, and in five years' time, nobody's coming to the visitor centre, the football team, well, that was a wonderful thing that happened five years ago. It's really incumbent, incumbent on the city to be knowing what we're going to be doing in, well, not next year, but three or four years' time to keep getting people coming. Absolutely so, and I think it's also worth remembering that what we have got particularly in Leicester is a very good shopping centre. But of course retailing in the city centre isn't enough. Uh, we need to have all the other things that are being done out in the public space and all those other attractions that bring people into uh, a city centre and make them choose to shop in a city centre when of course they can shop nowadays in an out-of-town shopping mall. British, why, first, why do you ask, but, but are you happy with what you've heard? Well, it's just because I work with like, businesses trying to get people here, and they've said with Richard III and Leicester City it would come, but what is, how are they actually coming here? You answer the question of what's being done when they get here, that's great, but how are you actually bringing them here apart from what they hear in the media? I think it's not a question of apart from what they hear in the media. I think actually what they hear in the media, what they see on television, what they hear on the radio, what they read in newspapers, what they see in magazines, is an important part of raising people's awareness that there is something here that is worth coming to. So, uh, yes, I think, of course, it's what we provide for them when they get here, but it's also about letting them know about us. Uh, and as I say, on the back of uh, burying King Richard and uh, winning the uh, Premier League, um, we've uh, now got an awful lot going for us. And because I've got the microphone, I'm going to ask the last question. And because, uh, as we speak, Father Christmas is polishing up his boots and getting the, the reindeers ready and so on, I just want one sentence from you. Uh, when he drags the stocking down your chimney and lays it at the foot of your bed or in front of your Christmas tree, along with the tangerine, what is the one thing that you would like for Christmas. Can we, have Peter 100, Salisbury. can we have our 155 million back, please? <laughs> I, I think that might, might tax him a bit. Rory Palmer. Uh, what's on my Christmas list? Lots of uh, cooking stuff, actually. Uh, my weekends are spent in the kitchen at the moment. <laughs> yes. Christmas is going to be spent in the kitchen, so there's one or two bits of cooking kits on my That's Christmas a very list. Good one. And Kirk, finally. Politically, I'll budget back. But personally, a calm Christmas day. <laughs> I meant to say a Labour government. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much once again thank for, you. Uh, for uh, being prepared to be asked these questions uh, by the public in Leicester. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together in the appropriate way.